All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Generation 180's Electrify Your Ride event, your ticket to flying electric. If you're here to learn how electric airplanes are part of our clean energy future, then you're in the right place. Today, we're joined by three fascinating experts. Nalakshi Huda, research assistant professor at Tufts University, an expert on urban air pollution, focusing on transportation emissions. Rhys Zuku, director of business and product development at Amp Air, developers of practical and compelling electric aircraft. And Tarek Weeks, chief engineer at Elroy Air, developer, developers of hybrid electric autonomous cargo delivery aircraft. But before we get started, I wanna tell you briefly about Generation 180. Next slide. We're a national nonprofit organization based in Charlottesville, Virginia, working to inspire and equip individuals to take action on clean energy. My name is Stuart Gardner, and I'm joined by my colleague, Blair St. Ledger Olson. And a special thanks to our team members working behind the scenes to help support this event. Next slide. Here's a quick look at Generation 180's three major focus areas of work. We're working to flip the energy script helping us move from a narrative focused on climate doom and gloom to a story focused on where we need to go, a world powered by 100% clean energy, a story that says we can do this and we all have a role to play. We focus on individuals in their homes and communities because your energy matters. Certain behaviors and technologies not only help fight climate change, but they also help build the social momentum and political will we need to get big system level changes. We lead two major nationwide campaigns, Solar for All Schools and Electrify Your Ride, which works to make EVs more accessible. Solar and EVs are clean energy solutions proven to address two of the largest sources of carbon dioxide, emissions from electricity generation and transportation. Next slide. All right, so a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, all attendees will remain on mute throughout the event. Uh, please use the Q&A to submit your questions. We'll get to as many of them as we can over the next hour. Uh, so, you know, without further ado, let's hear from our guests. Um, Nalak Nalak Nalakshi, do you want to kick us off and introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Nalakshi Hood. I'm a faculty at Tufts University, which is situated in Medford near Boston. I work um, or study urban air pollution primarily originating from transportation emissions. So that being on the ground cars and airplanes. I study the adverse impact that these transportation emissions from fossil fuel combustion have on our air quality. And then consequently, the impact that this adverse air quality has on human health. The work that I'm particularly proud of uh, is the work we did around LAX, wherein we used a uh, a technology that we call mobile monitoring, which is basically an electric car that has zero emissions. So we are not monitoring our own emissions and we rig it up with a whole lot of instruments. We uh, drive the car around sources that we want to uh, characterize. Uh, we pull the air in, redistribute it, and we understand what is uh, what are the chemical constituents or the air pollutants that are in the air. Uh, we drove that car around LAX to um, characterize the impact that the emissions from that airport have on air quality and found that um, uh, the impacts extended much farther than um, we had anybody had anticipated or had quantified so far thus far. Uh, they extend about 20 kilometers or 12 miles or so downwind in communities that are predominantly downwind of the airport most of the time because of the unique meteorology of LA region. Uh, and um, that work sort of brought to light the impact that airport emissions, which are airports are a huge source of emissions. Um, you know, altogether, all around put together, they can be about equivalent to about 25% of the highway length that is in a city like Los Angeles. So uh, it brought to light the giant impact that an airport can have on that was air quality and consequently the health effects that it can have on large number of residents that live around airports. About 10% of US population lives within 10 uh, miles off a major airport in US. Um, and these are communities that are environmental justice communities. So it's in the air pollution that is, uh, it's, I, no pun intended, it's an insult, you know, on top of everything else that uh, airports or, or airplanes bring about on in these communities. Wow, thank you, thank you. Um, glad that you're here with us. 
Brees, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Brees Zoku, uh, Director of Business and Product Development at Ampere. Uh, and Ampere, uh, we are building trusted, practical, and compelling electric aircraft solutions uh, to address the issue that, you know, Nilakshi very clearly, um, you know, laid out for us. And, and that's the, you know, sustainability and the emissions of, uh, you know, aircraft. Uh, now, we're targeting and starting at smaller planes, planes in uh, kind of the nine and 19 passenger category. And we're starting in kind of the most practical and pragmatic way. And that's with upgrading existing aircraft with hybrid powertrains. This still provides or is able to leverage the technology that's been developed in the automotive industry for electric powertrains uh, to pair that with uh, you know, traditional combustion uh, uh, engines to reduce the fuel consumption, uh, but still provide the performance and capability that customers, operators, and the public at large still expect. Uh, but that's not to say that we have our own vision of going fully electric someday. Actually, the background of my kind of Zoom is, the, is our tailwind concept. Uh, and that is a fully energy optimized um, clean sheet design uh, that you know, we use as our North Star for when we can really get to fully electric uh, passenger transport and cargo transport as well. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much Ampere in a nutshell. Awesome, thank you. And Tarek, you wanna round us out? Sure thing. Uh, my name is Tarek Weeks. I am the chief engineer at Alroy Air. Alroy Air is a company developing hybrid electric vertical takeoff unmanned aircraft. Uh, it's a mountainful, but what that basically means is that we are creating an aircraft that delivers cargo from point A to point B autonomously. Uh, part of that is one, uh, creating a vehicle that consumes less fuel uh, than your traditional helicopters. So we have opted for a hybrid electric approach with a transitioning uh, vertical and takeoff landing aircraft. Um, personally, I have spent the last four years uh, going through things like the aircraft configuration, basically what is the shape of a VTOL aircraft with that mission. I have spent time with the electric powertrain, so the limitations of things such as batteries and electric motors. Uh, and I've, I've also spent time um, with the systems and also we also flew an electric demonstrator a few years back. So ideally in the future, uh, we're always looking for opportunities to reduce fuel consumption and as well as using alternative sources of energy, um, even one day, possibly even going all electric. Um, so yes, that's LRA in a nutshell. Thank you. That's awesome, y'all. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna go ahead and kick things off with a, a few questions that we've already got lined up, but to everybody joining us, please don't uh, forget to put your questions in the Q&A. And if you can hear my dogs barking at our mailman, I'm very sorry, life in, life in COVID. <laughs> so kicking us off, we talk a lot at Generation 180 about electric cars. As Stuart said, it's one of our primary campaigns to accelerate adoption. Electric vehicles just look like regular cars though, um, for the most part. So a lot of the airplanes, however, the electric airplanes that we're seeing and be they prototypes or um, different models look very, very futuristic. So are all electric planes experimental or are there actually types of the technology currently in use today? And uh, Brees, let's start with you. Sure, so um, <clears throat> Ampere has been flying a demonstrator aircraft that takes an existing airframe, that's the Cessna 337 Skymaster, uh, and removes one combustion power plane. It's an it's uh, interesting configuration of the plane. There's one combustion system in the front, one combustion system in the rear. It's an inline configuration, which means if you change one of them, you don't have kind of the adverse effects of kind of matching the power on another side. Uh, so we've used that uh, in a couple different iterations to test our own hybrid or electric, fully electric powertrain rather, with kind of the, the combustion system as uh, additional power and, and in some cases the main source of power. Uh, so I would say that a lot of the, the uh, and 
I think we've seen other demonstrations from other companies uh, in the industry. So I think we're pretty far along in kind of getting this technology into airframes and in the air in, in kind of safe ways. Um, so I would say we're, we're, we're on the way that the real roadblock is just certifications, the FAA and the regulatory bodies uh, uh, that uh, for good reason, uh, you know, are the, the key obstacles to getting the technology to market. We're gonna definitely circle back to those barriers and touch upon that more because I definitely wanna hear more about that. Um, Tarek, do you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I could speak more specifically to uh, the different types of vehicles, and I can speak to what we're doing at Elroy. Um, first, at Elroy, we are making a series hybrid. What that means is that there's a combustion system, which turns a generator, which in turn uh, charges, charges the battery. Um, what you've seen that's unique in the electric space, uh, you've heard of probably electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, EV tolls. Uh, basically, what has happened because of electrification, uh, the design space has opened up, which has allowed different companies to make configurations of aircraft, which have multiple rotors, multiple propellers, uh, because they're no longer constrained by the limitation and cost of having a single propulsor or two propulsors turning propellers or fans. So what we have seen in terms of comparing it to hybrid cars, uh, is kind of the Prius model where the fuel system plus a battery system augments uh, a power bus, uh, which provides power to the motor. So you could have a much smaller uh, engine. Um, and at cruise, you could have a more fuel efficient system that's lower emissions. Uh, what we've also seen is full electric aircraft, which are, which, is a step away from the hybrid system, but you can convert a hybrid system into a fully electric aircraft. And we have flown an aircraft that was intended as a hybrid system as a full electric aircraft, right? So those aircraft, um, you can use traditional configurations for fixed wing aircraft, but you could also expand the bounds of the design space. So you see a lot of, for example, a tailwind concept, that is a concept that's optimized for an all electric mode where you have an integrated propulsor and the tail surface, right? So you have more design freedom and you could do things which you haven't seen traditionally that make aircraft more efficient. Um, and we're doing the same thing at Alpha Air. So that's a brief answer to that question. That's very, very cool. Thank you guys. With, uh, you know, another kind of on, design and manufacture, you know, we see with electric cars, a lot of new manufacturers getting involved. Is it similar with um, electric airplanes? Like, is it mostly uh, startups that are doing this or are the big manufacturers also getting involved? Will we, will we see like hybrid electric and electric planes from, from Boeing and Airbus and, and things like that? Or are they kind of waiting and seeing? And, and Brees or Tarek, I think that's probably for you as well. Yeah, uh, um, uh, we've seen, uh, everyone's interested in this space. I think we all understand that this is the future. Uh, um, there are kind of signs from governments all over the world, uh, especially in, in Europe and the UK, uh, that are advancing initiatives for sustainability and zeroing in on aviation as a, a big polluter. I think aviation accounts for close to 3%, if not more, of total global emissions. Uh, and based on the projections of kind of decarbonization of ground vehicles, aviation becomes then a larger and larger percentage of all uh, kind of transportation emissions. So governments are, are zeroing in here. Um, and I think that's what's um, uh, gonna provide the impetus for uh, larger companies to work with the small companies that are taking that risk in the technology. Uh, you know, your Boeings, your Airbus, they're interested and they have some of their teams working on it, uh, certainly, uh, but really putting kind of um, prototypes together, taking the risk on flight tests, that's really happening at the, the startup scale. Tarek, anything to add there? That's, that's awesome. That's a uh, brief, uh, uh, said it well, right? Um, 
their larger companies um, are not able to take the same type of risks uh, to make uh, these radical type of vehicles. Um, so what you're seeing is that you're seeing a lot of investment in two small companies. Um, the, I could name several programs, uh, for example, the Aurora program, there's the Airbus program. Um, there is even talk of another one from Embraer. Um, so there, you're seeing larger companies invest in the space. Um, and without a doubt, uh, once in the future, when the space matures, you might see either some of the smaller companies becoming larger, um, which is a very real possibility, or the, the larger companies absorbing them or mm. uh, having more of a presence. So um, they are there, uh, but you're not hearing a lot about them because they're kind of in the background. That's great, thank you guys. Um, so this next question is, we talk a lot about the benefits that electric cars have when we're talking to everyday people about this clean energy transition that Gen Generation 180 is helping to push forward. A lot of those benefits of owning an electric car are the obvious one comes to mind of fewer emissions, less maintenance, cheaper to fuel, and so on and so forth. And Nalakshmi, we'll start with you, but do electric planes have these similar benefits? What is your research showing? So my research thus far has shown that not only activity at the airport, but the landing overhead planes themselves have a very dramatic impact on basically deteriorating environmental quality in the, of the homes that are underneath the flight path to the extent that it's essentially the same as living on a interstate highway because you are living under a highway in the sky. So the obvious benefit there is that um, those emissions do go away. Electric planes don't make those em emissions, right? Um, uh, the other concern of the communities that live near airports or underneath flight pathways is sound. And I know that the, lots of companies are working on reducing just the engine sound, which is part of the part of the entire sound that's created. You know, part of the sound is just the a uh, plane cutting through the air itself and the turbulence. Um, so to, to a lot of the extent, uh, those environmental insults and impacts would be mitigated. That's sort of obvious to me. Brace, Tarek, do you guys have anything to add? I hadn't heard of that, the, the sound implications there in that research. Yeah, I think that the sound is, is um, going to be um, pretty, pretty dramatic shift. Uh, I think we've already seen some stats from fully electric aircraft that you know, have been operating, I think, uh, by, by aerospace, by Pipistrel, where you know, after a certain altitude that's relatively low, I think around 500 feet, you know, the, the aircraft are, are imperceptible. Right? And 500 feet, when talking about you know, aircraft, is actually extremely low. <laughs> uh, you know, normally, aircraft operate you know, twice or three times above that distance. About uh, 1,500 to 2,000 feet in altitude. Um, so yeah, you're, you, the whole spectrum of emissions uh, will really be reduced. Uh, and there's some interesting things that you can do as well in terms of the way that you operate the aircraft. Uh, maybe you know you pull down on your power be, during descent. Uh, so uh, you, you even in a hybrid system that's lower just engine noise. Uh, but others are working on airframe noise. Others are, you know, looking at um, propeller design to minimize noise from the actual propellers and, and, and the engines. Uh, so that's uh, all kind of in the mix. Um, and then, kind of to your uh, other points, Blair, that definitely, you know, we're seeing cost reductions, emissions reductions, maintenance reductions. Uh, you know, electric motors are effectively one moving part, and another only moving part that you have to care about is the bearing. Right, the bearing and then sometimes the windings and the insulation of the wires and, and all that stuff. But ultimately, that one moving part versus you know a, a combustion engine that might have hundreds or thousands of moving parts. Uh, so uh, that's where you see you know significant uh, cost reduction and maintenance as well. Let me add another thread there. 
So uh, often another uh, concern that's brought up, and especially with a lot of shift towards the next gen navigation technology and planes, uh, landing on a very precise narrow pathway, which sort of concentrates the impact right underneath the flight trajectory and in certain communities that are really underneath that flight trajectory. And sometimes dispersion is possible and sometimes it is, isn't. You know. uh, so it, to me, it's a sort of an intriguing idea on how like the flight trajectories or the pathways would change when electric planes are um, become full force. And you know, the opportunities that sort of that vertical takeoff or landing sort of offers, you know, the shift from flying over properties to doing a more vertical takeoff and just, you know, sort of taking that impact away from the communities that are around airports. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I, I could probably answer some of the flight trajectory questions as well. Um, for the, the first part here, um, if you're familiar with helicopters, there's a height velocity diagram, um, which basically says uh, that a helicopter, um, when taking off, uh, needs to follow a certain trajectory, because outside of that, if you have an engine failure, you have to auto-rotate, which basically means that um, the engine is disconnected from the rotor, and it needs to have a certain velocity going forward. Um, so that it could produce lift, right? So when you start talking about hybrid aircraft um, or electric aircraft even, um, you gain some freedom from that height velocity curve or dead man's curve, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, because you have things like motor redundancy. So uh, it's a big safety issue. So if you lose a motor in flight, you could still continue to fly. And then for our system, we have battery and power plant. So basically, if you lose a battery or lose a power plant altogether, the vehicle should still continue to be able to fly. So uh, what that means now, uh, coming back to noise dispersion and uh, impact communities, is that you can follow a very different trajectory for a VTOL into a approach uh, of, a, of an area, right? So you could actually break that curve a little bit um, so you could uh, you could approach a higher altitude. Um, you could take off from, from a, a higher location. You can also descend from a higher altitude. Um, so that is, that's something that you could look at for these VTOLs. Um, and then at the noise, for noise, um, when, when we're comparing ourselves to your tra traditional helicopters, um, the overflight noise is going to be similar to actually um, a uh, more of these electric aircraft or small G aircraft, if not quieter. Um, one, because you're able to use different power systems. So those systems could be properly muffled um, as well as you're using much lower power. And we also have the option of actually going all electric for certain parts of the cruise flight or throttling down uh, in certain areas. So I think, um, I think you're going to see more creative ways to get aircraft in and out of um, airports or heliports for that matter, uh, once we start taking, taking into account uh, electric, like fully electric aircraft or even hybrid electric. That's amazing. Um, I think someone might have mentioned, um, you know, the uh, airline's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Nalakshi, can you um, sp speak to that? You know, what is aviation's contribution to emissions and kind of what the health implications are around that? Do we know what, what the contribution is? Had that number memorized. Maybe I can uh, get back to you on that. But uh, yeah. we do know that um, it sort of went up threefold, the personal footprint between what it used to be versus when in COVID-19, there was a lockdown with the planes were still flying, the personal footprint sort of increased three times to ballooned to three times what it used to be. But uh, let me pull up that number and get back to you later in the discussion. And then, go ahead, Blair. I was gonna say, I, did I dream that someone said something like 3% <laughs> earlier in this conversation? Maybe Brees, was that you? Yeah, yeah it was, it was Three percent. I think it's something like 900 million tons of CO2 
um, you know, per year for, and that's aviation's mm. contribution to um, global emissions. Global. So in the US, I'm guessing it, it might be slightly more concentrated than being offset by global emission, but that, thank you. Um, yeah, and Nalakshi, if, if you come up, if find anything more interesting there for us to follow back, just flag us down and we will circle back to that point of the conversation. Um, and not to distract you from said uh, searching, but this next question, I do wanna start with you because we have talked about how transportation emissions of all kinds disproportionately impact disadvantaged communities. And Nalakshi, you really brought this home during your introduction, but I do wanna ask for everyone as well, and Nalakshi, we'll start with you though, how does this knowledge um, of this disproportionate impact impact your, you know, your everyday work, how your motivations impact your work and your organization's initiatives? Nalakshi, we'll start with you. Um, well, um, I do, all my work that I do is sort of community-based and community-based partnerships. And um, it doesn't take much to sort of, um, you know, just sort of imagine um, the neighborhoods around the main airport that you fly through, right? Uh, airports are a transportation hub. So it's not just the airport and the airplanes itself, but it's also the additional traffic that they attract, you know, uh, the cargo that moves, gets moved around, you know. So these are sort of, uh, these are communities that are uh, if on all metrics of environmental indicators that EPA uses in its environmental justice metric, they're highly skewed. And these are communities that are predominantly minority race communities. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, to me, uh, it's the environmental justice aspect of this work is obvious. And if that it wasn't enough of a motivator, then there's absolutely clear literature that links up a lot of adverse health effects to the to the environment, adverse environmental impacts that are uh, faced by these communities day in and day out, be it noise, be it elevated levels of uh, air pollution. Our own research quite lately has shown that there is an increased incident in, of preterm births um, around LAX. Uh, so there's a whole, and um, you know, imagine, um, you know, if you're in school and uh, day in and day out, just uh, planes flying over. And it's been clearly demonstrated that, uh, that also leads to adverse learning outcomes. Um, I can go on and on on specific health outcomes, but there's overwhelming research that links um, living near the airport to an adverse um, health. And um, not to mention also the property values are sort of depressed and it's, it's the whole cycle of things that comes about with uh, um, living near an airport. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Tarek, do you have anything to add? Uh, on the environmental health aspect here. Um, yeah, I, I was telling a surf story earlier to, to before we joined uh, the webinar around uh, a small experience I had as a child where basically they put a oil and gas storage facility next to the school I went to. And I just remember um, there was a small fire one day and everyone came out and looked at it and uh, fire went out, everyone back went back inside. And things like that are um, a big disruption. <laughs> um, and um, you also have negative health of outcomes from things like lead in the environment. So as you're familiar with like general aviation fuels, um, the 100 LL fuel that you, you generally see, um, that has lead, uh, tetraethyl lead, and that gets the atmosphere. Um, so one of the big things that we have um, made sure is that we're not going to use power systems or power plants that require that. Um, and the other thing that we've also made sure is that we want to be able to use systems that can use things like biofuels or be converted into something that's zero emission in the future fairly, fairly easily. Um, so I think there's a whole, as an engineer, uh, there's a whole like social aspect to kind of what we do. We don't necessarily see it every day. Um, and many of the decisions that we make uh, without thinking about it, for example, um, 
optimizing for uh, vehicle weight <laughs> versus necessarily uh, fuel consumption, right? Um, one hits a better bottom line, but the other impacts people closer to airports. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very there. There's a whole there's a whole set of um, factors that are going. Really, really interesting. I, I must mention that you know, leaded avgas is the only leaded fuel that's still yeah. in use in U.S. and it's the largest source of air burn lead contamination in U.S. Um, wow. And I'm very excited about uh, general how you know electric airplanes you know take off at general aviation airports mm -hmm. you know and how that ch changes happen in air taxi flights and stuff for which we have capacity almost right now. Maybe yeah, I had no today. idea. The, the the leaded air implications that's 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 crazy <laughs> Bruce, yeah, and, do you have anything I'll, yeah I'll, I'll add on to that definitely um what Neil actually said is 100 true um and what we're hoping for at Ampere and we're kind of supportive of the entire industry right you know we're focused on the goal and that's you know sustainable aviation and, and Ampere would like to be a small to you know medium to maybe even big part of that but ultimately, you know, we're very supportive of others in the industry that may be targeting at, you know, the, the core general aviation market, the kind of two-seaters, three-seaters, maybe even four-seater aircraft. And we're hoping that those will take a lot of the leaded fuel um, aircraft kind of out of rotation because it is the biggest, largest source of um, lead pollution. And it does disproportionately affect communities of color or just communities that live around airports. Um, so, so that's something that, you know, we're, we're pushing for um, and looking at innovative, innovative ways uh, to do that, not only with the aircraft, but potentially even with the infrastructure. Um, I think Milakshi mentioned, you know, the, the air taxi with using conventional aircraft or conventional hybrid or, or uh, fully electric aircraft. Uh, you know, the infrastructure in the U.S. has, you know, we have 5,000 airports, only 500 of which are actually used for any commercial activity. Uh, I think we did a study maybe a summer or two summers ago where about 90% of the population lives within about 30 miles. This is also in rural areas. Lives within 30 miles of an airport, maybe the number was 50, but it's relatively close. Let's call it an hour's drive. Some rural, I, and I've heard of you know, some people having to drive all the way from Lake Havasu to, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, which is you know, quite a bit, uh, quite a long drive to catch a commercial flight. And, and that's what they had to do you know, every time they were traveling either personally or for business. Um, so we're, we're hoping to open up that space and, and have some of these, uh, the, uh, the utilization of that infrastructure increase, but you know, in a way that's sustainable. Um, I think you know, we have to own up that hybrid isn't you know, the 100% solution. There still will be emissions. Uh, but we are looking, like Tarek said, at uh, using biofuels uh, and using uh, systems that rely more on Jet A, which is not a leaded fuel, um, and the emission spectrums is a little bit different as well. That, that's, a, that's amazing, the, the, the fact about you know, living so close to airports, and that's kind of a nice segue to the next question. Uh, you know, do you all see electric, uh, hybrid electric aircraft kind of democratizing air travel and air logistics? I mean, is it going to become cheaper and faster and, and more widely available? That's, you know, for anyone. Sure. Um, I, that's what we, that's what we hope for, right? Uh, the, the amazing thing about uh, what we're doing, um, it's, it's not necessarily, it's not just the, the fact that it's hybrid electric or electric, it's also the automation involved. Um, and it's also the scale of the vehicles involved as well. Um, what we think will happen, right? Uh, there are a lot of areas in the world where um, that it's a lot harder to develop the same kind of road infrastructure um, that we, we have in the US and we take for granted. Uh, even certain areas in the United States that are like this, um, that you might actually be better served using uh, VTOL aircraft or electric VTOL aircraft to, to undertake um, island to island, for example, or difficult to reach area to difficult to reach area. Um, there's a large time savings uh, involved with that. 
There's also, when you look at uh, fuel consumption or energy use, when compared to the truck that would make that route, um, it's often lower, <laughs> um, if not comparable, um, for even more direct routes. So uh, what we hope is that um, the systems that we're making will reduce the cost of, of that access. And therefore, with cost reduction comes democratization, right? Because now more people have access to something that was previously in luxury, so high-speed shipping um, in, uh, in difficult to access regions. That's, that's excellent. Uh, Brees, you agree with that? Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I'll add, you know, kind of the challenging geographies is, is, is a niche for, I think, uh, especially for, for Elroy Air. Um, I think the island hopping um, uh, is a way to make things more, more sustainable. Normally, islands are relatively close together, so they kind of fit the sweet spot for electric aircraft. Um, but really what I'm uh, keenly interested in uh, is uh, the impact for emerging markets. Uh, so in places like Africa, where the air um, kind of network is more fractured than you would expect, uh, you know, it could cost to, you know, from a flight from, you know, the Southern California to the Bay Area may cost, you know, $100 round trip or $150 round trip. That same distance in, in Africa, um, operated by the same plane, so the same cost basis, may cost about $500 round trip. And that's, that's for a lot of reasons. It's the same cost to operate, but there's some uh, political issues. But ultimately with a lower cost basis, you know, we're hoping that emerging markets can adopt this technology and have stronger intra-regional travel, which uh, will hopefully unlock more economic development. Uh, but you know, the same is true globally, right? That the, the more, uh, uh, you know, that costs drop, the more competitive um, that uh, uh, airlines can be in trying to capture kind of the overall demand. But I, I will caveat this in saying that, you know, we're providing the cost savings, but we, we, we kind of coin it as, you know, there's a hopefully a downward pressure on fares, but, you know, airlines could very well, you know, because they've been on thin margins for so long, you know, seek to um, uh, kind of take that cost as additional profit until maybe a second second competitor has a, a similar cost basis to compete with them on. That's really interesting. Thank you both. Um, our Q and A is, uh, to be colloquial, blowing up. Uh, so I'm going to try to weave some of those into my next question. Um, and like the last one, anyone is welcome to take this. Uh, so what I wanted to ask was what are some of the barriers preventing the electrification of air travel? You know, what are the key R&D challenges? And then we've got questions in the Q&A asking about um, physical limitations because currently battery powered planes can't consistently bring more than a few, uh, few passengers, more than a few hundred miles. Do you have evidence or expect that battery powered planes can one day bring dozens of people across the Atlantic or, you know, let's start with across the country. Um, and then a very similar question on that, you know, tech and R&D, what are you looking at in terms of just the efficiency gains? Uh, where, you know, where's that tipping point to where we've made the fuel powered um, air transport as efficient as possible and we really have to shift to fully battery electric or look into zero carbon technology. Does anybody want to start? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so, I, I, there are a few energy sources that you know we're considering right now that you know a lot of investors are investing in, you know clearly battery technology, fuel cells, and and others. And, and we've taken a look at kind of what uh, may be a, a um, both a, a technically feasible but you know cost efficient and practical uh, solution going forward. Um, so I think in terms of payload and range, that will be limited just by you know the physics of you know the energy and the batteries versus the energy and fuel. That's just um, uh, kind of the lay of the land, unless you know, in, in 10 years we get some, some magic battery or, or something. Um, so we won't see trans-oceanic flights, uh, but what we, what we may see is you know, varying degrees of hybridization. Uh, so uh, 
um, and, and that may reduce the, the passenger payload uh, or, or you know, the amount of cargo you can carry. But ultimately, you know, that's what uh, kind of the, some of the larger OEMs are, are looking into is how can they transition this technology uh, more and more into uh, you know, their core aircraft, which are kind of the, the single aisle market, which is 100 uh, passengers and above. And lately, we've seen some interesting architectures for those size of planes that use open rotors instead of you know, the traditional turbofan engines that we see on, on aircraft today. Thank you. Um, Tarek, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, um, this is something I, I made a tool to check and I check every day. Um, I kid you not, I go in and check every day. Every time I see a new um, battery technology, I see a new motor, I type it in my tool and I see, okay, <laughs> um, if you scale this to uh, something like a, a airliner, right? Um, how far will you get, right? And um, there are a couple like key limitations I could, as someone who, who's, who's been doing aircraft design, uh, I could probably talk to. Um, the first one is battery energy density. Um, so your best battery cells right now are running at about 280 watt hours per kilogram. Um, I may, may have screwed up the units there, but um, we, need to, we need to increase that, right? Um, so we need to increase it uh, well past 300 into the 400s, maybe even the five, well into the 500s to start talking about cross, um, cross US flights. Uh, the next bit here too is uh, the power density. So how much power is in a battery cell? Um, what I've, I guess I've been disappointed with is that we aren't seeing the same kinds of leaps in the power density as we've been seeing in the energy density. Um, and these are, this is uh, for a number of factors. So cell impedance, so basically how much resistance is in that individual battery cell and that determines how much heat comes out of that battery cell, right? So uh, what we need to see is that the, um, that value goes down um, and then that density goes up. And then the next bit here is actually the aircraft that we're designing, right? So your 737s, your 787s, your dash eights, they have, glide ratios, lift to drag ratios at around 20 to 30, some would argue even in the teens. Um, so what, what we need to see, like if you wanted to make a transoceanic aircraft with the current technology, uh, power system technology that we have today, we'll need to see things into the hundred, right? And that's never been done. Um, so, <laughs> I would say that there, part of it is on aircraft designers to make more efficient aircraft, and part of it is on, are on um, the electrical and chemical engineers to produce more efficient battery cells. And I haven't even gotten into the motor systems and environmental systems because uh, I saw some of the comments here. Um, cross-country electric aircraft might be traveling at different altitudes than typical aircraft. We don't know that yet, right? So um, there is, there's a lot um, from safety to chemistry to aircraft to even human factors. Um, how, how do ground crews interact with a 2000 volt um, system? Um, how do you get the power to a hub to charge all those aircraft? Um, so it, it's, it's a very, it's, it's kind of a, I almost want to say a moonshot type, uh, type project where it's across everyone that we need to collaborate and like make these things possible. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. The <laughs> One of the questions in the Q&A is, okay, there's a lot of real estate on those wings. What about solar to help? Yes. Do people look at that? Is that a real um, thing? So in my little tool of <laughs> what would happen, like, how would you like do this, right? Um, 
solar, it depends on how much power you're using um, and how far you're going and how much, how much wing area you have. And as a rule, you want to minimize the wing area of an aircraft because the wings produce drag. Um, so a brief answer to that is um, it's configuration dependent. Um, so uh, in the current configurations that you see right now, uh, that you see in general civil aircraft and maybe your all electric long range aircraft of 20, 30 years from now um, might follow, um, solar isn't the best way to increase the range. Um, it's time of day dependent um, and there that the weight of the solar panels um, might outweigh the benefits of the lower empty weight and additional battery system. So it's a configuration, configuration, engineer to engineer. Um, yeah. I guess great study. Yeah, that's it's it's similar in a way to uh, in in vehicles, you know, the efficiency of the engine or motor is just one element. There's the drag, there's the weight. That, that's interesting. Chris, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I was just say solar has a uh, has a part to play though, and that's in the infrastructure. Um, so uh, we're actually really big advocates of solar at airports and kind of transforming airports into kind of these green um, energy uh, uh, hubs, energy generation hubs. Uh, you can imagine, you know, a, a bus depot. You know, there's enough space. There's a ton of space at um, at airports. You can you know, park a fleet of bus, buses, charge off of solar panels, maybe on the airfield or in the kind of green space or, or, or brown space around airports. Um, and that just decreases the cost, um, better resiliency. And of course, the solar bus storage as well. I also think, seem to think that, you know, um, stationary storage is a great kind of um, second life for, you know, transportation or traction batteries. Um, so that's, that's hopefully kind of how uh, the industry will, will develop. Um, as an example, uh, I think Chattanooga Airport in Tennessee is running almost 100% on solar plus storage. Um, so if, if you got, guys want an interesting case study, look, look them up. Chattanooga, okay. Yeah, and here's another one from the Q&A. Uh, Tarek, when, when you were talking about autonomous, is that uh, truly autonomous, like we think of Tesla's autopilot or plane's autopilot, or is it like a drone where you have someone piloting it from um, another location? Yeah, I would say that um, it is monitored. Um, so the way uh, UAS, uh, unmanned aerial systems are uh, operated today, um, the flight plan, uh, is executed by the onboard autopilot, fully executed by the onboard autopilot. Um, and then you have things like detect and avoid um, that are starting to become incorporated onto more modern unmanned air aircraft, uh, which basically means that the aircraft could see and avoid an obstacle. Um, and typically in these operations, um, as they get more mature, um, they're going to be more and more integrated with the, with the airspace. Um, and then as to the point about how someone would operate one of these vehicles, uh, you would likely have a ground station operator who has the ability to intervene. So they can take manual, um, I said that in quotes because it's probably not fully manual control of the vehicle, but they can take manual control of the vehicle and fly that vehicle. But likely, um, you don't ever really want that to happen outside of an emergency um, because there are there are limitations to to um, your bandwidth and latency at those types of ranges. Um, so I hope that that's a that's an answer to that question. But basically, so Thomas bought monitored. And maybe in the future, you might have multiple aircraft being monitored by one person. Um, but yes, that's one of the ways that it All right, well, it's, it's sort of reassuring in a sense that there would still be someone 
kind of at the wheel, at the helm, so to speak, even if it's multiple and from afar. Um, so this next question and just flagging that we've only got a, we've got less than 10 minutes left. So we're probably gonna get through one or two more questions and then uh, start to wrap things up. But we talk a lot at Generation 180 about the electrification of everything. So not just cars, not just planes, but also the appliances in our homes, um, our hot water heaters, you know, and there are so many different pieces of technology and be it vehicles or the sky's the limit at airports themselves. Uh, so, and well, actually this, I wanna start with you first, really how important, and I'm just realizing we just lost Brees, um, how important is it from an emissions perspective, here it comes, um, is it to electrify the on the ground um, vehicles for lack of a better word, I'm, I'm sure you guys know more of the technical names, but all of the pieces of the airports, not just the planes themselves. Right, and that is like the primary opportunity, right? That is some the low hanging fruit that can make a real difference, something that can be done right away. And uh, like from an exposures perspective, you know, uh, it's this is not rocket science, you know, there's the source and there's the receptor and there isn't much to be done except for reducing the emissions from the source or distancing the source from the receptor. So you reduce the impact on the receptors, that is the people that live near airports. So um, I would think that uh, that is sort of the low hanging fruit and the opportunity right in front of us to electrify uh, all the ground source equipment, GSE or the support equipment at the airport to the extent that we can. All right, ground source equipment. That's what I'm going to remember for the next time I try to have that conversation. Um, Brees, Tarek, do you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think that um, kind of ground uh, equipment is going to be important. One thing that we're actually trying to do is kind of the infrastructure that may eventually charge aircraft um, to uh, kind of certify those as uh, carbon credit generating entities as well. Um, so that would provide further uh, economic incentive to have these, um, uh, this uh, kind of ecosystem of um, kind of green energy at airports. And in addition to that, you know, you have, you know, the um, ICAO, ICAO, um, what the acronym is, but they're one of the kind of overall global bodies in aviation, um, International Consortium of Aviation or something. And, uh, but they have a, um, a plan called Porcia, uh, which is how they're going to get to kind of net zero or, or emissions or really um, grow the aviation industry at kind of constant emissions. And part of that is, you know, and, and a large significant uh, percentage of those, um, uh, that strategy is buying or market-based measures. So buying up carbon credits. So right now airlines are amassing budgets to dump into, you know, to buy purchase carbon credits. And I think that'd be great for those carbon credits to be purchased from, you know, chargers charging electric aircraft. It's sort of an interesting point if I may uh, add thing. So uh, uh, the baseline for Corsia was supposed to be uh, 2019 and 2020 emissions, but 2020 is an atypical year. So they take 2020 out, which was an exceptionally high year of personal carbon footprint, uh, right? So now if you compare to the baseline of 2019 and given the projections for the airport industry to still grow, I mean, they wouldn't still, best project, optimistic projections still are that there wouldn't be as much growth for when the stage one of the supposed to pilot program of course was supposed to get evaluated. So airlines would now have sort of limited motivation to make those changes because of the, uh, the current market forces. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, Tarek, do you have anything to add there? Um, I would, in terms of infrastructure, I think um, we have uh, been trying to develop as much um, of an infrastructure kind of vehicle as possible. I think uh, with uh, Reese's comments about um, the uh, charging infrastructure at airports, um, that for us, um, if you are able to provide that, especially in a zero emission form, you can um, you can reduce the emission of vehicles in flight uh, because you could rely 
on the fact that you don't have to recharge the aircraft from like a fuel source. Um, and also with hybridization, you can actually, um, for shorter, shorter missions, you can actually uh, rely on the energy storage inside the battery. Um, so you don't have to use as much uh, power front. So I think um, these all like very good points around um, the, the emissions and the infrastructure surrounding uh, aircraft. In our, in our last two minutes, uh, would love to hear from each of you and uh, Nalakshi, you can start. Uh, what makes you optimistic about the future of the airline industry? Um, what are you looking forward potential to? Potential for change. That's my short answer. What a great potential for change. Tarek? I think uh, as, a, as an engineer, I think there there's so much exciting development that will happen in the next two to three decades around literally rethinking everything that we have built up uh, over the past seven <laughs> decades, right? Um, that if we're gonna get to uh, even aircraft that are zero emissions or even uh, aircraft that are full electric, um, it all has to change. Um, and I'm excited that uh, people are starting to talk about this. I'm excited that uh, airlines as well as the larger companies are investing in it. So I think uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, being one of those people who are going to work on developing that future. Awesome. And uh, Brees, bring us home. Yeah, I think um, what, what I'm excited about is how kind of gung-ho airlines actually are about not only the reduced cost basis, that's really what the, the it's attracting them, but we've seen so much of that paired with an actual sustainability focus. I think they see the writings on the wall and they, you know, want to change and, you know, Alaska Airlines, um, you know, has a really good sustainability program. Um, united uh, across their entire organization. Not only are they have the kind of the eco skies or uh, eco demonstrator uh, aircraft, but then also a lot of their uh, kind of corporate operations um, have uh, really large sustainable um, initiatives as well. So I think you know there's there's kind of been this global awareness uh, in the av aviation industry, and, and largely spurred, I think, by the startups, uh, quite honestly. Uh, and, and also kind of other social issues that have bubbled to the fore. Um, so I think within our lifetimes collectively, we'll see that shift, maybe not quite flying car, um, kind of Jetson's age, but you know that, that very first real step to get there. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, Nalakshi, Tarek, Brees, thank you so much for joining. It's, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, thank you for all the attendees today. Uh, we're going to post a recording of this on our YouTube channel. Uh, to find out more about Generation 180, go to our website, generation180.org. And while you're there, uh, sign the Going Electric Pledge. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a, uh, have a good rest of your week and uh, take care. Thank you all so much. Stay safe. Bye-bye.